Hello there. So this weekend, and while I've been away at the conference, I've been looking over the responses that you made on this document on Thursday. And I'm finding um, for several of you some incomplete answers, some inconsistencies, um, and maybe some misunderstandings for a few of the questions. So I wanted to hit some highlights just to make sure that you're clear and hopefully this helps you understand the topic better because oftentimes when people study the Civil War, they focus only on the battles, right? That's the fun part. But the political and economic issues during the war drove the war. Political problems, economic problems caused certain decisions to be made that affected the outcome of the war and it affected how long the war lasted. It affected how Jefferson Davis made decisions about key strategies. It certainly affected Lincoln and trying to keep the Union together. So this is a very, very important topic. So let me just start with the first one. Historians have referred to Lincoln as a political genius, yet he was unpopular among many factions of the Union. Well, think about the speeches that Lincoln gave. Lincoln was able to repurpose the Civil War in just a few years. Uh, Lincoln's cabinet, Lincoln, um, if there's a great book by Doris Carnes Goodwin that I read several years ago called Team of Rivals, Lincoln chose a cabinet of people that never thought he should be president. These were people like uh, Sam and Chase, William Henry Seward, a Secretary of State. These were people that were assumed that they would be the nominees by the Republican Party in 1860. And instead, Lincoln was chosen somewhat by surprise. And they questioned, who is this backwoods guy from Illinois? Yet he brought those rivals and those competing ideas into his cabinet. Even at you know, one point had someone who was a former Democrat in his cabinet. And then, as you know, in 1864, he chose Andrew Johnson as his vice president. So Lincoln was very, very good at political moderation. And I'll put that here. So this is how Lincoln becomes this mastermind. He has to do certain things. If we think about political problems faced during the war, he suspends habeas corpus in a place like Maryland because we can't lose Maryland um, to the Confederacy or else Washington, D.C. would be surrounded. He takes away civil liberties in some of the border states. Uh, he has to en enact a draft, which was very controversial in 1863. So in order to do this, Lincoln navigates the politics and builds consensus through moderation in order to make these things palatable. Um, that doesn't mean it was perfect. I mean, there were several times that Lincoln may have lost the war and may have lost all political support. So let's take a look. We mentioned political problems. <clears throat> Obviously, the divisions during the war, um, especially as we think about, let me go off my pen mode here for a second. Um, if we think about the question of about slavery, would slaves be freed as a result of the Civil War? How would slaves be used? Um, should slavery remain? Should we compromise with the South, fight a war with the South? When do we give up? How long are we going to take? These are all huge political questions that Lincoln has to wrestle with and continue to keep the vision. What's the vision that Lincoln has? The vision is we can't allow secession. If we allow secession, we might as well tear up the entire Constitution. In order to save the nation, we have to endure this long fight. Um, economic problems, how the biggest question becomes money for the North and for the South. Now, of course, the South, this is an even bigger problem. But for the North, how are we going to manufacture all of the war materials? How are we going to sustain this fight? Uh, some of the things that the Lincoln cabinet comes up with is our first income tax, as well as printing greenbacks. These are greenbacks were federally protected treasury notes, a paper money system. Now, this doesn't last, by the way, after the Civil War, paper money goes away, and we go back to gold and silver and banks printing their old bank notes. But it's interesting that these two elements become precursors to what occurs in the 20th century. In the progressive age, in the early 20th century, the government created the income tax and greenbacks, or today we call them dollar bills. So these are some of the problems. Uh, by the way, what up about tariffs? We know that Lincoln raises tariffs during the war. Uh, what about trade with Britain while well, we're suspecting that Britain is wanting to help the Confederacy? 
So again, there's a lot of political and economic questions that Lincoln has to wrestle with. Now, this next item, Lincoln did not enter office intending to be the great emancipator. But there's a lot of things that contribute to this change, and hopefully, uh, for CMOD, you've already seen my video on ending slavery. DMOD, I'm going to teach that on Monday. Um, but politics is what contributes to that change. When the war first started, Lincoln said if he could win the war without freeing a single slave, he would do it. Um, but then, as Union armies moved through the South, and slaves started freeing themselves, and then the Union army started confiscating slaves as enemy property. That eventually pushed Lincoln to the Emancipation Proclamation as a war measure. And then in Lincoln's mind, he really started to change and say that, really, at this point, there's no way we could go back. What's going to happen to those slaves that were freed under the Emancipation Proclamation? Would they go back to slavery when the war was over? Lincoln knew that the eventual vision had to be ending slavery. And so we get the 13th Amendment at the end of the war, right? But really, from 1861 to this point, it is a progression. Okay, so what made Lincoln different from past presidents? I saw a lot of good answers about this about uh, Lincoln being from the Midwest, Lincoln not having lots of political experience, being more moderate. Uh, Lincoln was a lawyer and understood the Constitution well, um, but how did he go against the Constitution? Well, I saw many of you talked about the Maryland crisis and suspending habeas corpus, and so that was good. Um, now, here's where we had some disparity in answers. At the start of the conflict... Most predicted that this would be a short, limited war. How did the length of the of the war affect politics on both sides? Well, for the Union, remember, everyone expected this was going to be a 90-day war. Like many wars in American history, the longer this drags out, the more political problems the president's going to have. Um, we've seen this throughout American history, and it was certainly the same for Lincoln. More and more people questioned his leadership. Republicans had political problems in the midterm elections of 1862. Um, people were writing to their senators and congressmen to maybe you know, stop funding the army, to why are, why are we giving our boys a, as the bloodletting continued and dragged on and dragged on and the death toll rose. Uh, once Lincoln puts Grant in charge, people say, he's a butcher, how can we accept all these losses? And so it really became the job of Lincoln to keep the vision. What's the long-term vision? We have to win. We have to save the Union. We have to finish this out and ensure that the Union is whole again. That has to be the vision. And like many times, when there is a clear vision, often people in the moment don't see the vision. They see the immediate. They see the pain, the suffering, the problems in the immediate situation, they don't see the long-term vision. Good leaders always see the bigger picture. They have to see the forest through the trees. Now, how did politics affect how the war was fought and the military decisions made? Think about Lincoln's generals. It, he should have probably chosen Grant much, much sooner. But if you look at all those early generals in the East, McClellan especially, Meade, these guys were Democrats. Lincoln did that on purpose because, again, he had to build consensus. He had to build support. But eventually he realizes the whole consensus thing's not working. He needs somebody like Grant to win the war. Um, now, as for the political parties, I did see some issues here. So let's talk about the different political factions. Oh, I didn't know I could make that spin. Um, first, we'll deal with the Democrats, right? So the Democrats start to split into factions. You have war Democrats. Okay, so I got interrupted somehow in my app, so I'm going to start back here with this. So war Democrats, again, were those who supported the war but did not necessarily support a war against slavery. They supported a war against secession and wanted to bring the U Union back together. But when Lincoln started turning the course of the war towards a war against slavery, they weren't so thrilled. Copperhead Democrats 
were those Democrats who opposed the war, wanted an immediate end, certainly wanted to keep slaves in bondage. They will be Lincoln's biggest political opponents. Then you have moderate Republicans. These guys um, so typically support Lincoln. And then radical Republicans were those that believed that slavery needed to end sooner rather than later. These guys will argue that Lincoln was not doing enough to end slavery. He was not doing enough to punish the South. Um, and so they are the ones pushing for a 13th Amendment much, much sooner. So this is the political problem that Lincoln has to navigate in the Union and keeping the Union together. We know Lincoln would fit in this camp, but he has to appeal to these people, and he has to bring in these people, which he does in 1864 by forming the Union Party and choosing Andrew Johnson. So again, important to look at these political factions. And by the way, if you want to see some humorous political cartoons, go look at some of the Copperhead political cartoons or political cartoons that included Copperhead Democrats. Okay, so then if we look at foreign affairs, we've already addressed this somewhat in class. The Confederacy needed help. There was no way, given the population and the resources of the South, that they could fight this war and win their independence without foreign assistance. And, of course, we know that the Emancipation Proclamation really closed the door to that. And I saw that in a lot of your notes because, politically, the people of Britain would not support a war for slavery and be on the pro-slavery side. Um, when it was just a war about union and secession, the British were actually very, very close um, to helping the South. And it looks like many of you got the Trent Affair, so I'll skip over that. Um, as I was reviewing your notes, I saw that many of you wrote out good notes for uh, the Homestead Act and the Pacific Railroad Act, and also mentioned that Republicans were able to pass higher tariffs. And first, we have to ask, why? Why could we now get these laws, which prior to the Civil War probably would not have been possible? Um, Southern Democrats were traditionally those that wanted a smaller, limited federal government. They're not there in Congress to vote against these measures. And so now that Republicans hold control and most of Congress is made up of Northerners and Westerners, it's finally a chance that they can get these measures passed, things that they've always, always wanted, like giving land to people in the West, federal government funding of the railroads, which we will cover in, in January. Also, we have a national banking system and greenbacks, which I mentioned previously, and income taxes. But then I saw that um, there were many missing responses for this part. The last question from the Eric Foner article, did the war help or hurt economic growth in the short run? Well, we have conflicting arguments on this. In one way, we could say that it did help the economy because it led to a second industrial revolution. All of the mechanisms needed for war had to be produced in the North. And so that created the, the massive railroad industry. It, it helped to spur on the factory system and further revolutionize the factory system, um, improve the technology of factories that then would lead in the 1870s and 1880s to the growth of steel um, and other big industries. Also, of course, we the United States will surpass Great Britain as the largest industrial economy in the world because of the Civil War. But how did it hurt? Well, inflation um, certainly hurt. And also, you're sending your male population off to war. It's harming the labor force. And so those are the points that Eric Foner makes in his article. And then finally, just to wrap up a few of these, um, Many of you had good answers to the question about why the Confederacy had to have a draft much earlier. Um, clearly don't have as much population. But they, they do exempt slaveholders. Um, why? Because if you have 20 or more slaves, somebody has to stay behind um, to keep the slaves from running away. Now, as the war drags on, um, you know, slavery is going to fall apart in the South. Um, but in the Union also, and on, really on both sides, people could purchase substitutes. So it does lend to that argument that this was a rich man's war but a poor man's fight because it was the Southern political leaders that were arguing to keep slavery 
um, that led to secession, right? And remember, most whites in the South didn't own slaves, but their political leaders did. They were the wealthy Southerners. That political debate caused secession. Secession caused war. So it was a rich man's war. But if you look at the people who were actually doing the fighting, they weren't invested in the slavery debate. You know, northern boys who fought for the Union, many of them didn't care about slavery. They weren't fighting for slavery. Some of them were collecting a paycheck. They were fighting for Union, or they had been drafted. Uh, The same goes in the South. Okay. Um, And then I saw good answers for this. Um, Life in the South just falls apart because, again, they don't have a treasury. They don't have as many supplies. They have to um, hope for foreign help, which doesn't come. And so life in the South really starts to fall apart. Um, In fact, it's interesting when you read the letters that women in the Confederacy wrote to their husbands. At the beginning of the war, it was, you know, go kill those Yankees and um, defend our land. And by 1863, 1864, the tone of the letters changed. It was, please come home. There's no bread. Um, the Negroes, how they called slaves, have left. Um, There were home guards in the South. Home guards were older men who were left behind to keep law and order. But then as the food started running out, some of these older men started to turn on their own people and steal from women who were helpless, women and children who were helpless, because all the young male population was off fighting the war. So um, life in the South turns becomes very, very poor. Um, There was a movie, uh, Cold Mountain, that came out about 10 or 15 years ago um, that illustrated this, about how life really kind of ground to a halt. And so the terrible economic situation in the South, as well as the fact that the North had better railroads, better industry, um, and better organization, thanks to Lincoln, Um, and how he uses the telegraph and the railroads, all of that helps to contribute to a Union victory. In fact, this is what allowed the Union to win the war. First, Lincoln's vision and patience to stay the course. He knew, and Grant knew, that the Union could outlast the Confederacy. So I'll stop there. I hope that this has helped you maybe fill in your notes and understand the topic better. And now I need to uh, leave for the airport. So I'll see you Monday. Take care.